Hello, this is John Schaap and welcome to this video in the updated 2021 version of the AOS 8 video series. In this video I'm going to show you how AAA profiles are used to apply a policy to wireless users by using user roles. Every single user is always assigned a user role when connecting via the controller on an untrusted interface. GRE tunnels from access points are always untrusted so user roles are applied there and wired interfaces can be configured as untrusted when you also want to use user roles on wired interfaces. The lab setup is still the same as in previous videos, so uh, two mobility conductors and uh, three mobility controllers in a primary zone and also the data zone controller which is not used in this video, but the setup is uh, exactly the same as in previous videos. So then we have to talk about licenses. You do need AP and PEF licenses. AP uh, to be able to terminate APs and PEF to be able to uh, configure user roles and everything that we're going to see in this video. Uh, you also need the mobility conductor and virtual mobility controller licenses in uh, the setup as I am using it. So roles and policies, uh, what are they? Uh, the client in an Aruba-centric network is associated with a user role which determines the client network privileges, how often they must be re-authenticated and also which bandwidth contracts are applicable to each client. A policy is a set of rules that apply to the traffic that passes through the Aruba managed device. You can specify one or more policies for user role as you will see in the examples. And finally, you can assign a user role to clients before or after they get authenticated to the system. So how does the assignment of user roles uh, work? What's the workflow? It can be done in any of these uh, ways that you see here. It can either be manually assign it or change a user role manually. Uh, it can be the initial user role configured in the AAA profile. It can be the default user role configured in the AAA profile. Uh, the user role can be derived from user attributes upon the client's association. We call that user derived role, UDR. And the last two methods uh, are using a radius server. So the first one is using at specific attributes that you return from the radius server. And you can choose these attributes yourself. Or use the Aruba VSA. There's a specific Aruba VSA to return the user role. And if you return that one, that uh, always takes precedence over any other user roles assigned. So let's have a look where to configure roles and policies. You see them here, roles and policies. You can basically configure everything from the roles tab. So we're going to have a look at uh, one of the roles that I have already configured. That's the guest role. And what you will see in the guest role, if you go to the advanced view, is under policies, you see a global SACL and RF SACL. Those are factory default installed uh, ACLs. You cannot modify them. You should not remove them. You should, le should leave them there. And after that, you see the third one. What else can you configure in a role? You can configure bandwidth policies. Kilobits, megabits per role, per user, or per AP group and also in the up and downstream direction. You can configure per application limits for this role and per application limit exceptions for this role. So assigning an internal or external captive portal can be done over here. There's uh, four different choices here. For three for internal and one for the external captive portal. Under uh, more, you will find the VLAN assignment, the reauthentication interval, maximum number of firewall sessions, deep packet inspection and web content classification, YouTube education, OpenFlow, and VPN and authentication uh, config items that uh, we're not going to further discuss in this video. So let's see. What can be uh, configured in a, uh, in a rule? So you click plus, you take the rule type access control or application, and it's IPv4 or v6. The source is any user host network, alias, local IP or user role. And the same goes for destination. So what do all these things mean? Any, of course, is uh, any. 
uh, user is replaced by the IP address that the Wi-Fi user gets via DHCP. Host is a fixed IP address, a host address. Network is a complete subnet. Alias is one of the aliases that you configured under the alias tab. Local IP is replaced with the IP address of the controller. And user role, uh, that can be used to configure user role to user role um, firewall policies. So you can say this user role is allowed to talk to this user role or not talk to talk to this other user role. Then we have the servers app, so it can be any TCP, UDP, service protocol or ICMP. And then the action permit, deny, reject, redirect and uh, different net functions that you see over here. You can set the toss bit, you can set a time range, so you can say a specific ACL is only active between this and this hours. <coughs> you have to first configure the time range to do that. You can set the dot one P priority. And you can lock, mirror, deny list, or disable scanning. Be careful with logging, it can fill up the lock uh, very quickly if there's a lot of traffic. Uh, the queue can be uh, high or low, and you can have a description for it. So if you go for the other one, application, that is of course application based, so similar things here with source destinations. V4, V6 again, but source destination is only any or user. The scope can be application, application category, or web category. Application is a list of almost 3,600 different applications that are being recognized. An app category are these categories of different apps. And the web category reputation is this list that you see over here. For a web category, you do also need the web CC license. So the action is then deny or permit, and you can set the same things as with the other rules. So let's have a look how to configure an alias. You go to the aliases tab and you click plus, um, give it a name. So I'm gonna do one for RFC 1918 in here. Uh, I have the choice of these five items. I'm going to do network, so network 10 with 255.0.0. So these are all the private uh, IP address ranges uh, that can be used in a network. And I want to have them under an alias so that I can use just one uh, alias name in a uh, ACL to uh, specify all these uh, subnets. Otherwise, you would have, would have to specify all these different subnets one by one, and it will create an enormous amount of ACLs. So alias is configured. And then you go to your role. I'm going to create two roles here. One is an employee role. And the guest role that you have seen already in the previous part of this video is being created here from scratch. So now we have two roles created. Employee role. I always go directly to advanced view. So you see the system ACLs, the SECLs, the two. Don't modify them, don't do anything with them. Just leave them there. And then the one that's automatically created with the same name. And that's where you can say, uh, create the first rule. So it's going to be V4. And I'm going to set the TOS to 20, the priority dot from P to 3, and the Q to high. So this will match any traffic, and everything will be uh, signed with those uh, values that I just created. And I will show you later on how that uh, is going to look in the command line interface when a user is in this role. The guest role, um, I already pre-configured uh, all these items here. And you see that on line number five, for destination I have used RFC 1918. That's the alias that we just configured. 
So that means that if anybody tries to go to any of those uh, private subnets, that's being denied because it's a deny action statement. And for the rest, a guest user is only allowed ICMP, HTTP and HTTPS. So if you go to the show uh, user table, this is the first method of uh, changing the role of a user. You see that the user is an authenticated role and I'm going to do AAA user add, then the IP address of the user, then the role and then the name of the role. So I change it to guest role. You see that the user is now in guest role. It was in authenticated before and I manually now change it to the guest role. And if you then go to the session table, we can exactly see what is happening with the traffic of this end user. So you see here that the this is a ping. The ping was not allowed to the internal subnet. Uh, and you see the D, the deny statement. So this traffic is denied because there's the D flag. All the other flags are explained if you do show data pod session table without the include statement. Then you will see the whole uh, table. And all the other traffic uh, doesn't have the D flag, so that's traffic that's being allowed. So we're going to move the user again, but now to the other role that we have configured, the employee role. Show it again, and you see that the user is now in the employee role. And we're going to do the data pod session table again, now with uh, a P behind it. Uh, that gives you the, uh, the labels above uh, all the things. And you see that the priority in the TOS bit 3 and 20, and also that it has the H flag for, high, uh, for the high Q. So all the things that we have configured in that. Uh, Access control list are being applied to that traffic in the employee role. Show writes is a nice command to see uh, everything in a uh, role. So you do show writes and then the name of the role. And you can see all the ACLs. So again, number one and two are the, uh, the system ACLs. Don't touch them. And number three is the one that we have configured here. And here you see every single statement. There's eight rules in that role. And if you do the same for employee, you see there's just one statement here, and that puts it in the high queue, TOS 20, dot one p number three. Show user table IP and the IP address of the end user shows you uh, very important information on how the role was uh, derived. So you see here that the employee one with the IP address and that MAC address as the employee role and the role derivation was CLI. So that's a manual CLI intervention that I just showed you how to do that. So let's go to the AAA profiles. They are very important for assigning roles if you do authentication. So there's the initial role, that's the role if there's no authentication. So if you just connect to an open network, that's the role that you get. If you do successful MAC authentication, you get that role. And if you do successful to the next authentication, you get this role. So I'm going to change that to employee role right now. So that means that if the if the user is authenticated successfully with 802.1x, it gets the employee role. I'm going to show the user table. It's empty, so there's no user connected right now. Now we're going to connect the user and uh, do 802.1x authentication. And after that, you will see that the user has the employee role. And if you then do show user table IP and the IP address, you see that it's different right now. The how is role derivation dot one X, and that's exactly what has just happened. So let's do user derived roles. So you're gonna do a new user derived role. I'm gonna do an iPad user rule, and in there. You can say set type role or VLAN, <coughs> and it can be BSSID and any of the other things that you see here. I'm going to do it on MAC address. If the MAC address contains this string, I want to assign the role test role. 
So whenever a device with this MAC address connects to the network, it will get this role. There's something else that you still need to do. You have to go to the AAA profile and the AAA profile that's used on your SSID. So you see the initial role there and the MAC and .NX roles, but there's also the user derivation rules that is set to none. You have to modify that to the rule that you just created. And save it again. Okay, we go to the user table again. And we see that it's now in the guest guest logon role. That's the initial role. This command, AA use delete, is very useful in situations like this when you have to test things because you can then remove users from the user table. Otherwise, uh, they own, are only being removed after a five minute uh, timeout. So for testing, when you change roles all the time like this, it's very easy to use this command. So we're going to connect the user again right now after uh, updating the config that you just saw and you see that it's now in the test role. If you then do um, the same thing with the IP address again, you will see that the role derivation is now initial role, but there is also a UDR flag which is now set to one. So it means that a user derived rule has been applied. Otherwise the UDR flag is zero. And that's the test role that you see over there. Okay, now have, let's have a look how to return an attribute from a radius server. So you see that the default role is employee role for 82.1x, but we're gonna send a different role back from ClearPass. So from ClearPass, we're going to send the radius VSA Aruba user role with the value ClearPass role back to the controller. So I'm going to check the access tracker of ClearPass. And of course, it's only sending the name of the role back. So you do need to configure the role first on your controller. It needs to be exactly the same name. And here comes the authentication. And we're gonna check the um, output and what is sent back to the controller. And Aruba user role, ClearPass role has been sent back. So let's check that right now in the command line interface. So I'm gonna check the user table and you see that employee one is in the ClearPass role. So this role has been sent back from the uh, radius server with an Aruba VSA. And you also see that here back in the show user table with the IP address, you see role derivation dot one X VSA. And then the last example is uh, not using the VSA, but another attribute sending back from the radius server. Uh, so we first need to select which attribute we're going to use for this. Uh, I've decided to use a filter ID for that. So check for filter ID in the list of attributes. So if the filter ID contains, the operand is 999, so if it contains this value, then the controller will assign a role. And we're going to use the ClearPass role again. And now you need to go to, um, to your radius server and uh, modify that so that it sends back that filter ID with the value 999. So here I made a copy of the enforcement profile with filter ID value 999. Modify the policy. So modify the rules. Remove the default one and add the one that we have just created with filter ID so that it that value is being sent back when the user authenticates. So I'm gonna check the access tracker again and authenticate with the user. And then we're gonna see what, will, what has been sent back. And here you go, output, 
You see, filter ID value 999, that's what be, that is what has been sent back to the controller. If you then go to the controller, you do show user table again, you see that it is again in the clear pass role, but now not with the VSA, but with another attribute called filter ID. And you'll see a difference here. You now see SDR, server derived rule. So it's again dot one x, but now with an SDR. That brings us to the end of this video. So let's recap what we have done. Every user in the Aruba Mobility Controller is always assigned a user role. You do need the PEF license installed if you want to be able to modify the user roles. Stateful firewall rules, VLAN assignment, benefit contracts, and reauthentication are all part of user roles. There are many ways of assigning user roles, and the simplest ones are the initial and default role assignment, but also user-derived roles can be used. More sophisticated is using a, a radius server and using server-derived rules. And we have seen that by using the Aruba vendor-specific attribute called Aruba user role, but also using a standard IETF radius attribute like filter ID. Last method not shown in this video is using downloadable user roles, which can be done with ClearPass. And then you do not need to configure the user roles on your controllers, but instead they are downloaded from the ClearPass server on demand. Please like, subscribe, and let me know in the comments what you think. Bye for now.